Those of you who happen to really enjoy the chapter reviews where I, or rather the section reviews, where I'm really commentary heavy, this will be a great video for you. Those that don't, I'm so sorry. I have a lot. I have too many scenes that I'm going to spend too much time on. So apologies in advance if that's not your thing. Also, yesterday I posted a bonus video uh, where I talked about what my plans are for this channel moving forward once I catch up with One Piece because I have this week and I have next week and then I'm caught up week to week and some things are gonna change, hopefully for, hopefully in a good way. Uh, go check out that video if you haven't already. It's only five minutes, it won't take much of your time, um, but that will give you an idea of what my plans are moving forward. But right now we're discussing chapters 1001 through 125. 1,025, I'm not going backwards. And, oh, okay, we'll go. So the last chapter, you probably remember what chapter 1,000 is. <sighs> Highlights of this fight, because again, I'm gonna try to, this is going to be a commentary heavy video, so I'm going to try to breeze through some things. But highlights of this fight. I love this fight. Honestly, I'm 1,025 chapters in now, and when I went back to look at these chapters to kind of get my thoughts together for this video, I had already forgotten how much fun, like how dramatic and exciting and also hilarious this fight was. I love these five together. I love Luffy and Zoro and Kid and Killer and Law. Their dynamics of how grumpy <laughs> several of these people are to be working together, yet how well they work together, is incredible. Coupled with Oda's paneling, I mean truly the fights are so gorgeous. I love just just staring at these panels for a while and I'm just having a great time. So some highlights that I loved. Um, Luffy hit Kaido and he's confused and he wonders how high this kid's ceiling is. What were, what were his actual words? I have it right here. How high will your ceiling go? Oh, hey, I remembered it, cool. While he's thinking about some pretty legendary figures over Luffy's shoulder and that is a really powerful moment for our boy. I love that Zoro used Foxfire's uh, Foxfire style and he split the flames, Mo M Big Mom's um, flamey fella. I love that, I love the amount of honor that the characters are showing each other, not just Luffy's crew showing honor to him and the Red Scabbards showing honor to Odin, but them showing honor to each other in big ways, but as well as in these very simple ways. Of course, Zoro, Zoro is proud of himself for having stolen that move, but I like to think that it, it goes a little bit further than just cool move, mine now. I like to think that it was also paying tribute to someone that he respects. I love uh, Luffy giving out orders, telling people to do things, and then Law, <laughs> Law is a character that I regularly forget is in this fight, but every time he's on the page, he has me cracking up because he is so grumpy, but so compliant. He he gets an order and he does it, but then he's mad at Luffy for giving him the order. I want to make clear that I would have done that thing even if you didn't tell me to, and you telling me to makes me look bad. And then, and then just a few minutes later, when Zoro tells him to uh, make him fly so that he can slice into Kaido. And, and Law, <laughs> he's grumpy about it, but he will do it. He's a team player, but he will grumble the entire time. And I just think that's so funny. Couple that with bits, like when they have this giant flame coming at them, and then Luffy turns to them. It was Luffy, right? Yeah, it was. Luffy turns to them and he's like, last person to flinch is the loser. And they're like, I'm not gonna do it. And he says, that's fine. I guess you're just losers then. <laughs> and then we get one of the best comedic relief panels in the midst of a terrifying fight of them all flinching as close, as far back as they can. And I don't know, it looks like Law won. I mean, he was the last, did I say the last one to flinch loses? First one to flinch loses. The flame seems to be closest to Law's face. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying, Law won that one. Oh yeah, and then, uh, <laughs> 
and then Zoro is suddenly Zoro is being relegated to uh, to keep everybody in line a little bit and and handle situations, which you know it's not. He's a kid too, and yet he's the one that's like, could you grow up a little, maybe? Sorry, my cat wants out. Right as I was sitting down to film, he wanted in, so watch him want in again in two minutes. Anyway, I also love the panels where they're all up against Kaido and Mom together. It's just beautiful. It's just beautiful, the angles that Oda chose and the way he drew Big Mom and Kaido so looming over them and their specific fighting styles. It's just beautiful. And then we're also constantly given these incredible one-liners as they're facing off of the, off against each other. It's just, I just, I'm, it's, I, I love it. We, of course, have Luffy going all out, losing his powers for 10 minutes, losing his hockey ability for 10 minutes, and Zoro carrying him out. And I, I, I love, again, I've said this many times, I love how often Luffy is, is carried out of fights because um, it just really reflects his humility and I think reflects one of the best parts about Luffy and that's that he he can't do it without his crew, you know, is, is strong and tenacious and... Um, determined as he is, he cannot win without his crew. And that is constantly amplified by the way that his crew not just rallies around him, but has to pick him up and carry him uh, because he becomes so vulnerable so often. And I love that. I love that little detail. And I also love his humility in that where, you know, Luffy is, is completely drained and can't move. And then he looks up and sees that Zoro's carrying him, and he's just like, oh, thanks, Zoro. Thanks, Zoro. This guy's a natural disaster. I just, I love that humility of, like, not grumbling to be carried, but just, oh, my guy's got me. Thanks, man. I just, mm, mm. Um, The dragon twister demolition, demol, demolition, demolition, the dragon twister? Oh my goodness, another incredible, incredible panel. Oh, right, okay, a lot going on, a lot more fights. I'm gonna breeze past them all. Uh, <laughs> First of all, I don't know who it was, who the shadowy figure was that was attempting to save our samurai. It could be Momo's sister, whose name I've forgotten, Hiori? Hiori, no way. Wow, I'm actually getting okay at names. It could be Hiori, because at this point, I, what, what purpose will she serve, Oda? At this point, she had some setup and then she was just dropped, which is normal for this series. Characters come in, they get filled up, and then they disappear for a really long time, and then they show up for the Calvary moment, right? So it could definitely be Hiori, because at this point, I'm still just waiting on her to become to do something. Her arc is definitely very incomplete, and I think she has to be a part of the battle. I feel like her setup is too important, and her buildup was too, uh, too much time was given to her for her not to matter at all in this entire epic battle. And I'm still waiting on her. So my only guess of this panel, if you know what I'm talking about, where the red scabbards are all kind of piled up in this room and it says, it's hard to make out through the gloom, but someone is attempting to save the samurai. Go now, go quick and kill. Someone is there. And we get a half silhouette of uh, someone's mouth and nose and a lock of hair. And it, it could be Hiori, and that's the only guess I have because I'm just waiting for her to be relevant again. Okay, this is gonna be my first uh, tangent. And that's this scene with uh, Sanji getting caught in the web of Black Maria and her subjects and uh, and them, them wanting Robin. They're here for Robin. They wanna torture her. They wanna, I mean, Kaido and... Um, Big Mom have already made clear that they want to keep Robin alive because she's useful if they're going to get to uh, the One Piece. So I assume Black Maria is here to capture her and to break her will and then serve her to Kaido. That's my guess. But anyway, it's not going to work out. So she captured Sanji and Sanji's weakness is women. 
in general. So they want him to call out to Robin. And everybody doesn't expect it to work out. They expect they're going to have to torture him. They're going to have to beat him down. They're going to have to force him into it. And he very quickly just starts screaming, Robin, help me. And I love this scene for a lot of reasons. I'm going to do my best to explain why. One, um, I like that the scene of the panel of Sanji screaming out for Robin <clears throat> looks so much like the panel of Robin screaming out, I want to live. I really, really like that similarity. I really like that Sanji, who's... Uh, one of his his shticks has been that he won't fight a woman, he won't cause harm to a woman. So you would expect that Sanji would be like, "No, I'm not going to put Robin in danger. I'm not going to I'm not going to put her in that position. I'll I'll die before I will potentially harm Robin." I love that he had so much trust that Robin could handle herself, that he's not viewing her as a damsel, but he's viewing her as a teammate and a competent one. I love that when he screams out for Robin to come help him, we get to see quick flashes of the crew and we see who they're fighting going, ha, what a weakling. And our crew saying, oh, it must be a false alarm. He must, he must know, or he must be trapped and know that uh, they all understood the situation. They understood that that it wasn't it wasn't what it seemed. I appreciate the crew's faith in one another always. Anytime that comes up, they're unwavering. Oh, okay, it's fine. And Robin's gonna handle it. And Sanji hasn't betrayed anything. I love their faith in one another. But then also, then Robin arrives on the scene. I love that Robin also understood the situ situation, knew if he's calling out for me, there must be some sort of trap. So I'll come prepared. And then Brooke on her heels, which man, I okay, I have two, I have two, there's too many things that I love about this scene. It goes, it's like a web of its own. I'll start with Brooke. I love Brooke. I have grown to love this character so much. This this polite, um, cordial powerhouse who is always a supporting character. I love that. Back in uh, post in lobby, I think it was. No, post, post war saga. The one when they went to the knot island and they got paw pawed away. I love when Zoro was down, and he had he had just had his nothing happen moment, and he was weak, and he was not good, and Sanji always had eyes on Zoro. Do you remember my fixation on that? And Sanji was making sure that Zoro was good without revealing to anybody that, uh, that Zoro was weak. And he was being his backup. And then you have Brooke in the background, who also saw everything conveniently. And he also is just shadowing. He's just behind them saying, okay, you know what? I know what's going on here, so I'll help Sanji in this. I will also take care of Zoro and make sure he's good. And when Sanji was getting Zoro out of the danger, Brooke grabbed Zoro's swords and followed behind him. And those little moments like that are really, really important to me because I think that it shows the level of support that this crew gives to one e to, to each other. I think it shows it even better than the than the big acts. These little these little spots of, okay, I understand the situation. I'm right on your heels and I'm here to support you. This is your moment. I'm here as a support. And Brooke realizing the situation as well and realizing I'm I'm just going to I'm going to go as Robin's backup. I feel like that's the that's the role he falls into constantly. You know, in 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 moments of big action, he's rarely the centerpiece. He's usually doing things in the background and goes unnoticed a lot of times for me. And then I see him in these little roles where he's also just he's just shadowing his friends saying, "No problem. I got your back. If you need me, I'm here." In this situation, Brooke came in. Do you remember in, I had to, I had to go back and check. I had to ask my patrons. I was like, am I remembering this correctly? I think it was in Thriller Bark when Robin was caught in a spider's web and Brooke was the one that cut her free. And then here they are 
Sanji is is in a spider's web and Brooke comes and cuts Sanji free. And there's so many little things like that all throughout this section that just to me harkens back to all these little moments that our crew has had together and 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 they're still having them together. And then there's also now I'm jumping ahead but also in this fight that we don't get for chapters and chapters and chapters later when Robin uh when Sanji's already free and Robin grabs a hold of Brooke and then grabs a hold of the web and gets them out of the fire when the whole place is on fire. And Brooke just politely turns to Robin and says, would you mind dangling me by your side just a little bit longer, please? And then uses his ice powers to freeze the demon from hell or whatever that thing in the wheel is. There was also the thing when when all those those minions of Black Maria were lined up watching the fight and Brooke's like, thanks for lining yourselves up. And he just cuts them all down. Brooke is such an incredible supporting character because he's just there. He's just, he sees a situation, he gets it, and he just shadows people. And he's like, I'm your support not trying to take the spotlight, but because he's so incredible, he still has these awesome, just like realizing, oh, okay, my ice powers will be useful here. I'll just handle that demon wheel thing. Oh, look, the chicks are lined up. I'll just cut through them real fast. He shines as a supporter, maybe more than any of the others. That's not true. I, that, I shouldn't say that. Don't forget I said it. He shines so bright as a supporting character. And I feel like his humility and his kindness and his his ability to just understand where he's needed is incredible. Now let's talk about Robin because she's the real star. I just needed a Brooke tangent for a second. Back to Robin, as Sanji is screaming that and as he's getting beat up by Black Maria, Robin comes in. She comes charging in the moment. And I know I'm thinking about the scene all out of order because I already talked about Brooke so much, but but let's take a second to just appreciate when Robin walks in the room. And she says, I spent a lot of time working in evil organizations, and when someone does horrible things to my friends, the demon part of me starts to emerge. And this line was excellent when I read it the first time, but let me tell you, now that I've seen her demon form, I die. I also love that underneath in this panel, she comes in and she's standing there and saying it, and then it's kind of a split panel, and then you see her eyes are a little bit different. And it's it's foreshadowing, and I didn't see it. I didn't see, usually, I feel like I do okay with Oda's foreshadowing, with seeing it and saying, that there's something there, what's gonna happen here? Nope, didn't see it. Her eyes were different. And one thing too is, so here's the thing. <laughs> um, we do, uh, over on my Patreon, we do uh, live readings on the Discord where we like live react as we're reading stuff. I do it. And then there are people on the Discord who have never read One Piece who are further back than I am. And they have live reaction threads too. We just, we're a very obsessive group of people apparently. And one of my mods uh, who kind of runs the place in the in the One Piece world of my of my Discord, she is reading through One Piece for the first time. And she is, uh, she's, she just finished Ennis Lobby. And I had just finished watching her live reactions. And then I came over here and watched this and, and read this for the first time. And so this panel where Robin, where Sanji's running away because he realizes he's useless here because, because of his weakness to women. Um, and Robin turns to Sanji and, and says to him, thanks for relying on me for help. I really appreciate that. That panel hit me extra hard because I was just watching Lynn, my mod, react to Innes Lobby. And I had just re-experienced the emotions of Robin rejecting them and not wanting them to come and save her because she didn't want she didn't want to take the risk on a crew. She didn't she didn't trust that anyone would accept her, but then also she didn't want them to get hurt and just all the complexities that come with why she repeatedly rejected them and they kept fighting for her anyway. And and then and then whenever she finally does tell them I want to live and they promise to take her home with them to take her with them. It's such an incredible moment, but having that moment relived right at the same time as I'm living this moment of Robin, of Robin saying, thank you for relying on me. It really just hit me extra hard 
remembering her not wanting to rely on them and then turning around and saying, I'm so glad that you guys can rely on me and how much that meant to her. It was a single panel, but I think it was one of the things that hit me the hardest in this whole sequence. Oh yeah, and then, so then Black Maria strips and she says, uh, uh, listen to me, Nico Robin, at the end of this, you're going to belong to Master Kaido. And her simple reply of, no thanks, I'd rather be dead. And I forgot to mention her flashback. It was so lovely to see Sabo and Koala so excitedly teaching Robin how to fight. Any time that I get to harken back to, I get to see just a flash of Robin when she was with the Revolutionary Army is a gem to me. I also, I love and I hurt for, so they had, the, they did the illusions with Black Maria. They did the illusions showing Robin with the, uh, with the people in her life that were significant. And it hurts me to see her so happy to see them. I'm so proud of her that she saw through it, that she knew it wasn't real, but it, there's no way that didn't hurt. Brooke's line, when Robin says, you didn't have any problem with them either. And he says, well, after 50 years of practice, wishing every day that the death of your friends was only a dream, one does get used to being hurt by illusions. I love these two together. I love these two together because I think they fight well together because they're both incredibly powerful people that end up being supporting characters so often, but that can hold their own. And they, and they, they, they're so good at being support characters, but this scene, this line really punched me <laughs> in the chest. Black Maria used her illusions to try to manipulate them into, uh, a false security. But what she didn't realize is that she was up against Robin and Brooke. And what, with what they've been through in the world, the pain and the solitude, they see through so many of the illusions of the world. They see the world with brutal honesty. Robin is smart and resourceful. She grabs Brooke. I already talked about all of that sequence where they get out of the flamey rooms and Brooke is amazing and Robin is amazing and everybody is amazing. But when all that doesn't work, Black Maria changes tactics to gaslighting. She starts trying to tell them, here it is. Don't, don't you get it, Robin? It's obvious to anyone with a brain that you've been sold out by your friends. Blackleg knew I was hunting for you and he helped lure you right into my trap. But once again, she doesn't realize who she's up against. Another thing that these two have gained in what they've been through in life is a home and a family. They do not question their crew. They do not question where they belong and who they belong to. And when she tries to manipulate them verbally because the illusions didn't work, Robin's response is, no, he's a very kind man. You don't need to know what it means that Sanji relied upon me for help. He's truly worthy of being the wings of the King of Pirates. I'm just so proud of them. You know, they've been through so much and they are still so haunted by their past, but they're so strong and they're so happy with who they're with. That they, that they don't question them. It really just, I thought it was a really powerful scene. Um, more action chapters after this. I'll be honest with you, Hyoguro, H Hyoguro? Am I remembering his name correctly? Hang on, let me double check. Hyoguro. Yeah, hey, sweet. Okay, Hyoguro. Um, He's not landing for me. I, I thought he would. When I met him in prison and when he did some quick, uh, rapid training with Luffy to help him uh, break through the collar thingy when they were in the fight club fighting ring. Um, I thought he was gonna do more for me than he is. And he's a cool character now that he is somehow tapping into a bunch of the strength because of, I don't really understand what's happening with his body actually. But I, it's, <sighs> It's one of those weird things where it's like, this is a character that I feel could, at least at this point, don't fight me. Well, you can fight me, it's okay, but don't. At this point, where I am at in reading, 
I do, I, you could remove him from the story and the story wouldn't, wouldn't really be that affected. Here's the thing. Sometimes I think Oda knocks it out of the park with how he balances his giant, his giant cast of characters. I loved the way he handled it in Whole Cake Island. I loved Big Mom and her crew of children. I loved having this massive cast of people that just made her feel, made her army feel too big to be able to do anything with. And I didn't really need to know every character on any sort of deeper level. But the thing is that Whole Cake Island, the emotions were really hyper-focused on Sanji and our crew and a few others, like putting a few other key characters. But the emotions really weren't as widespread as they are in Wano. In Wano, Oda is applying a lot of emotional impact in a lot of places, and it's working in a lot of places for me. Obviously, I'm invested in my crew. I've become incredibly invested in the Red Scabbards. But then there's people like Hyogoro, who I feel like Oda wants me to be just as invested in with, you know, with him realizing that he's probably not going to make it out alive on this fight and him trying to get his crew to um, kill him if, it, if he turns on them because he doesn't want to do that, understandably so. And he has a lot of really emotional moments. And I think that Oda writes those emotional moments really well but I don't fully feel the impact of them because I don't know Hyogoro. I'm not really attached to him. I thought I would become attached to him, but not enough time and attention has been put into his character for me to really care that much about what he's doing. Couple that with the fact that he and his people are fighting against enemies that I don't actually care about. They're not, they're not part of the Kaido world that I'm invested in. And these fight sequences and these emotional beats just don't fully land for me. So all that to say, I'm gonna breeze right past this. So that we can talk about Marco because Marco is someone that I'm very invested in. And lines like, you don't even get to think about those samurai until you've finished me off. And the fight panels, the fact that I'm, I'm really invested in Queen because I love him despite him being pure evil. I'm really invested in Marco and he, all of his panels are beautiful because of the way Oda draws him. I'm not really invested in King Super Tons, but he's also a dinosaur, so I'm happy to have him around. But the fact that Marco, my Marco, is casually holding off two commanders of an emperor of the sea, it just, like, He's, he's past his prime, and he's still so incredible. Couple that also, too, with the fact that we're literally having a dinosaur laser fight. I just, I'm, I'm living my dream. I, I, this is hitting me like 10 years too late, because I'm 28 or 29. How old am I? I'm old. I'm an adult. I'm an adult. So maybe this could have hit me as a kid, but honestly, I get to enjoy it more now because because we're having a freaking dinosaur laser fight. Queen has laser beams, and I just, I'm so happy with the ridiculous, and not only that, this is a different fight, this is Frankie's fight, but we also have a triceratops that turns into a helicopter. I couldn't be happier. Chopper got some really great uh, moments in this section that I'm covering as well. So I'm just gonna compile them really quick and have a little bit of Chopper love here. Monster Chopper fighting against Queen, so satisfying. Actually, anytime Monster Chopper arrives on the scene, I'm thrilled because I love his design as a monster. I love that he can now control his monster form. I'm so proud of him. I love the, every time he turns into Monster Chopper, I'm reminded of his origins. I'm reminded of where we came from when we met him, when he was ashamed and rejected and called a monster. And that was, that was a shameful title to him. And now it's something that he, that 
it isn't shameful to him anymore. It's now something that he is able to become and control and use to protect his crew. And I just think that's really, really beautiful. Plus, I just really love watching Monster Fight. Monster Chopper slap down a dinosaur. I'm a simple person. But on top of that, we also get Chopper, the core of who he is, the, the true Chopper, which is not Monster Chopper, it's Dr. Chopper. And while I do have my nitpicks about the way this whole thing played out and some of you don't agree with me, and that's cool. That's fine. I stand by it all. Um, I am thrilled with him being able to solve the solution and save all the people. I think that his little chopper cloud solution was adorable, and I'm just really happy for him. I Granted, there's a lot of people that were infected that are just bodies, like they're not people that I necessarily am invested in, but saving lives is always cool. And also I'm just happy for Chopper because this is, this is the true Chopper is saving people. And I, I'm, I'm really happy that he was able to accomplish this so well. Oh yeah. Okay. So now let's talk about some fake out deaths. Uh, Odin's alive. What? How could this be? Um, Ashuro, Ashu, Ashuro Do, Doji doesn't trust it. And I gotta tell you, he's my guy. I love this character's name who I cannot pronounce. I have, I have, I feel like I have cre I've, I've, I've developed an attachment to him that began when I first met him and that has withstood the test of time despite the fact that his character really hasn't been terribly explored that much. I'm just happy with every panel he's on. And the fact that he saw through Kinju Kinjuro, damn it, Kinjuro, the fact that he saw Kinjuro, saw through Kinjuro's disguise and knew immediately this is not our Odin. Now, I don't blame anyone. They're, they're battered and broken and they live in the One Piece world where people don't die. <laughs> so, so I don't blame them for thinking, okay, yeah, it's totally Odin. Um, but I'm proud, I'm so proud of my boy for knowing and uh, from fully trusting him. I'm, I'm proud of him and I love him. Also, Odin is still alive, which honestly, I feel a little bit dumb for not realizing that with his not Hydra creature, I don't remember what his creature is. It's not a Hydra, but it's like, there's a lot of heads and only one of them was cut off. I, he wasn't in his Hydra form when he got his head cut off. I didn't realize that his human head could, he could, human body could sprout another human head too. It's my bad. I really should have. I've been living in One Piece world for over a year now. I should have known. But anyway, a lot happened in this chapter and it's, I'm not a theorizer, but I will say that the fact that Momo has the voice of all things, which we already knew because of Zoe, and he can feel, he knew Luffy was, I mean, this isn't the chapter. I'm kind of jumping around now. Um, he's, his power is now being compared to uh, Kaido's by Yamato and uh we later see him tuning in to Luffy while Luffy is drowning and delivering a message from him. He also has the connection with Kaido's fruit of uh, his fruit being, I guess, a replica of Kaido's, an unstable one, an imperfect one. But that definitely, that definitely elevates Momo in my mind for his ability to face off against Kaido, which really makes sense. Let's talk about that for a second. It really makes sense that it has to be Momo versus Kaido at some point. I don't think Momo is gonna necessarily be the one to take Kaido down. I really don't know what that part of this battle is going to look like, but between the amount that that Oda has drawn parallels between the two with the devil fruits um, and several other things, that I can't think of right now. But then also the emotional ties to them with, you know, Kaido hunting him down, Kaido being the one to kill his dad, Kaido dangling him above the above the buildings and Momo being genuinely terrified of Kaido. The fact that they have the same, not the same, but similar devil fruits that Momo has the recreation of his devil fruit, plus all the emotional ties between the two, there's definitely going to be, I think there has to be 
a, a point where Momo has to face off against Kaido. Their strength is in no way matched, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical confrontation. I think probably an emotional one. Momo has already stood up emotionally more and more throughout this arc where he's saying, I know I'm not my father, but I'm still not backing down. And, um, you know, when he's being beaten and still saying that he's going to be uh, the leader of Wano. There have been a lot of moments like that that are building up, and I think they're building up specifically for something like that between him and Kaido as well. And I think there's probably a lot more subtext happening here than I even realize as well as far as the world uh, goes. Like Momo having the voice of all things, I... There's, there's a lot of world buildy and theorizing things that I'm definitely at a disadvantage of, disadvantage in having only read the series through one time. So I, there's a lot of the world building that I haven't fully wrapped my mind around. So I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that's also really going over my head. Anyway, <laughs> Oda killed Orochi and then brought him back with only seven heads left. I guess for shock factor, because then immediately he fights off against the red scabbards and they're just like, let's cut all the heads off. And now he's down to one again. So it's like, I killed him and then I brought him back. Oh, he has seven lives. He has seven more deaths. One, just, just the one. Another uh, section, another scene that I really loved was of course, cutting back to Kaido and Big Mom and our uh, worst generation. I love this massive uh, attack. What was it? Conquest of the sea. And Zoro stepping in and blocking it and absorbing so much of it and taking all that damage. Kaido being able to tell that their voices haven't gone out. So does he have the voice of all things too? And then Zoro using, expending the last bit of his power, turning to law and saying, listen, Traffy, which again, I love that they have not stopped using this terrible nickname for him. <laughs> listen, Traffy, what I'm about to do is the limit of my ability. If the fight drags on, we're only wearing ourselves down. If we can't break through, we die. After this, it's all you. And then he uses Emma? I don't remember his sword's name. Hey, Kaido, that's my captain. And then he uses the thing, the thing from Ennis Lobby. Was it Ennis Lobby that we haven't seen in so long? I thought it was a fluke. I gave up waiting for this to come back. I've been waiting for this to come back and I thought it was a fluke. And here he is using it again. Demon aura, nine sword style. I don't know, but look at him using it. It looks so good. But anyway, he, he worked. He hit Kaido. So he has Conqueror's Hockey. Did I understand it correctly? Zoro has Conqueror's Hockey. And then Luffy is getting some amazing hits in too. And then the line, Zoro Traffy, thanks for protecting me. You can go now. I'm going to beat him no matter what it takes. Go ahead and let everyone know. So Luffy's hockey is stronger than I ever knew. And Zoro's hockey is Conqueror's hockey. Apparently we're just giving that out. I'm not mad. Killer and Kid are uh, going on and Kid tells Killer to go on. Other way around, Killer tells Kid to go on. Keep going, Kid. Don't let mom get uh, go unchecked. So Kid's going off to face off against mom. Killer is going to face off against Hawkins by himself. And I love Hawkins. I love his design. I love his powers. He's terrifying and he has the soul of Kid. So if Hawkins, I'm jumping ahead now. This is telling things out of order. If Ki Killer tries to kill Hawkins, good job, you did it. And you killed your captain. <sighs> so when... They brought up the fact that Hawkins didn't have a lot, a lot of lives left. I figured it would be an important life that he had left. I'm, I cannot wait. I'm not to that point yet. I cannot wait to see how we resolve this because I don't know. I love the scene when uh, <laughs> Sanji shows up and Law, who's beaten and broken and tired, just so elegantly sitting on top of Sanji with his legs crossed, trying to look cool. And, uh, 
and he finally gets to be the person that doesn't listen. People are constantly taking over control and issuing orders and completely ignoring Law's objections, and finally it's Law that gets to do it. When he says, good timing, Blackleg, take him. And he passes off Zoro with a bunch of instructions on how to tend to his wounds. And Sanji says, I'm not a doctor. I don't have time to fix him up. And uh, and Law's just, Law just ignores him. He keeps charging forward. He, he has other things to do. And Sanji does. He does take the time to fix him up. And, and then he uses him as a weapon. And the entire sequence of Zoro wrapped up in this cross-like splint that's covered in gauze and the most ridiculous nonsense in the world. And then using him as a weapon, Zoro randomly falling asleep throughout of it, throughout it, then bickering constantly. It was a great gag that I did not get tired of. And frankly, it could have gone on longer, but also it's been awesome since he's been out. So I'm, I, everything is wonderful. I loved the little exchange immediately after uh, Sanji wraps him up. And Zoro says, it seemed like he figured something out. He's gonna win. And Sanji says, I already knew he would. I love their faith in their captain. So Big Mom remembers Tama and is very defensive over her. And Ulti decides to harm her. Which, I mean, fair enough. Ulti's powers are causing a huge disruption in the fight. And, and what, what does Ulti care about a child versus a human? She's a killer. And uh, a child versus a human, a child versus an adult, she's a killer, she's a bad guy. So in her eyes, you are disrupting the balances of this fight. You should be removed. But Big Mom is furious about this and I fully expected an Emperor of the Sea who's basically a wild card at this point because she's mentally unstable and you never know if she's going to be using her powers to fight Kaido, fight with Kaido or fight against his crew because they made her mad because she likes Tama and she's in mom mode. She's, she's, she's a mess. And um, I fully expected her to take on Ulti, but I gotta tell you, I'm so happy that's not what happened. It took my breath away. My jaw dropped when I'm expecting this Emperor of the Sea to slap Ulti down, but instead Nami steps in front of an Emperor of the Sea to face off against the woman who, not very long ago, beat her down and Nami fully thought that Ulti was going to kill her. She 100% was convinced my life ends here in the arms of Ulti. And now, because of Tama, Nami steps in front of an emperor of the sea to face off against the woman who near killed her and who I imagine she has a lot of fear for and strikes her because she wanted to defend this child. I really love how Tama has become so emotionally significant for so many of these characters. I kind of breezed past Usopp. Usopp also had a great uh, portion of this where uh, Nami couldn't strike Ulti because she was holding Tama. So Usopp used his bag of tricks uh, to be able to separate them and then Nami could strike and I love that teamwork. I love this moment for Nami. I'm so glad Nami got it. I really feel like Nami is getting a lot of really incredible moments in the Wano arc so far with her being really beaten down more than I've seen her beaten in a long time with her having to, um, I don't know, she's always kind of been the one that much like Usopp, that's fine with lying, that's fine with manipulating, that's fine with cheating. She literally just tried to turn Ulti and Big Mom against each other, right in front of each other. It was hilarious. Her, she's more of a pirate than most of them, if we can be honest. She's very comfortable with pinning people against each other, with lying, with stealing, with manipulating. She is Nami. And her standing her ground for her captain and then her standing her ground for Tama, she's had some incredible moments. But of course, Nami's not strong enough to take on Ulti, so Big Mom did step in and finish the job, which, you know, was good. I liked it. Speaking of Tama, I do have 
some moral questions. There's so many moral in- implications to Tama using her face cheeks to force people into allegiance to her. And it seems like they can be hellbent on one direction and then they eat her face cheeks and then they're hellbent in another direction. And it seems like they're, it seems like their freedoms have been removed from them. And I do have many questions about this because it's being treated as a good thing and a series that is so strongly focused on freedoms and fighting for people's freedoms and giving people their freedom. I'm just a bit confused as to why Tama's a isn't horrifying and in fact a good thing. Now it is good because it is turning the tides of this fight and likely Tama will be a huge contributor in our victory as a whole, but also she's contributing by removing people's freedoms in a story about freedom and I am confused. Oh yeah, and then we had the whole sequence with Zeus where mom replaced him and then, and then the female cloud ate him and then he became the weather staff and Nami was still mad at him but it turns out he's enhancing the weather staff and I guess Zeus is part of the crew now. It's one piece and it's a wild ride. Oh yeah and Kid. So Kid decides I'm gonna take down Big Mom which Little, little, it's interesting matchup. I mean, I trust him. I haven't seen Kid in action an extreme amount, but every time I have seen him in action, he's cool. And I really like Kid, so I'm rooting for you, pal. But the scene where he used his garbage <laughs> powers to create that giant hand and just smash her face into the ground, I loved it. His powers, I love to watch him in action. And seeing him smash mom's face into the ground I, was very satisfying. Oh yeah, and then Luffy falls. I've kind of already mentioned it because I'm talking about things out of order a lot, but then Luffy falls and he falls into the water. Kaido says you can be Joy Boy either, it seems which is interesting. I'm not surprised that Kaido knows who Joy Boy is because he was a part of the Rocks crew and knew a lot of very infamous people. So I'm sure he has a lot of information that we don't have. Oh, right. When I was talking about Momo and I was talking about how uh, much I expect him to do, I forgot to mention he also has read through Odin's journal. So he has a lot of information that we don't have. He has a lot of info. Momo and Yamato have so much information at, at this point. Whenever we sit down at the end of this arc and talk to Robin and she translates the Poneglyphs, I wonder if we're also going to sit down with Momo and Yamato and learn a whole bunch from Odin's journal or if they're just going to be like, all right, bye. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you anything. The scene when, uh, oh, what's his name? Kenjiro, Kenjiro, when he is impersonating Odin again and we have to see the joy on Momo's face at seeing his dad and then the red scabbards, you know, saying, no, it's not true, don't believe it. I really, really hurt for Momo because, you know, he really, he's only lost his dad recently. Um, I can't really remember how much time has passed because for me, a lot of time has passed since Punk Hazard, going through Dressrosa and Whole Cake Island and and now Wano, a lot of time has passed, more for you than for me. Um, so it's hard for me to remember, but I know Dressrosa took place in like a day or two and Whole Cake Island, I don't think took, it wasn't a long one either. So I feel like it's been real short for Momo. He lost his dad really recently. He's still grieving heavily. And he hasn't really had a chance to process that grief at all because all along the way, he's also been losing a bunch of other people and his land and had to deal with a lot of emotions. And so this kid, this child, this child who just lost his dad is now in the middle of a fight where he's way over his head and he's been beaten, bludgeoned. He's been through so much and then he sees his dad and he's so happy. And I just, I just, that hurts. And then couple that with the fact that Kiku, Kiku knew that this was not Odin, but still couldn't 
take him down, still couldn't kill the likeness of Odin, and in that ended up being stabbed. And the panel of Foxfire catching her as she fell. We finally did kill Kinjuro again. Uh, you know, we'll see if this one sticks. But that scene, uh, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, we keep killing people and I feel all the emotions. Odo writes emotions so well. So I allow myself to feel them. You know, I feel the pain of this death of Kiku's. I feel the pain of Doji, uh, Ashu Ashura Doji's sacrifice. I feel the pain of Kinemon being stabbed. I feel the pain of all these deaths because Oda writes the emotion so well, but still in the back of the, my mind, I'm like, well, you know, they've died a couple times already. We'll see how this one goes. And, and that's my biggest problem with Oda is his fake out deaths. I hate it because it's gotten to the point now where he writes the emotion so well that I feel it, but I don't feel it. It doesn't cut me to my core like it's supposed to because it's just constant. It's just so constant. I'm exhausted by it, honestly. And I, I'm genuinely afraid that at some point, someone in the Red Scabbards is going to die. For real. And it'll stick. Maybe. And I'm not gonna feel it like I should, because at this point, I don't feel anything like I should when death is on the table, because I have seen it and been lied to about it so many times. So all these, all these, all these painful, painful emotional moments, I feel the emotions because of how well Oda writes it. But at the same time, I only feel it so deep because it's like, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. And that's just a shame. That's just really a shame that this series that I am so emotionally invested in that my emotions are relatively removed in this category because the excessive fake out deaths. <laughs> Sweet soft chopper crying because Luffy failed and Sanji saying, don't cry idiot. After all this time we've been together, how many miracles have you seen? Take care of him. He's got strength of 10 and he's healthy. I love this scene because um, chopper is so wholesome and his pain at knowing that Luffy failed is honest and deserved. But Sanji, having gone through Whole Cake Island just two seconds ago, his faith in, in Luffy and in his crew, again with Robin, will not be wavered. And that really shows a lot of, of his character growth that we got in Whole Cake Island. But then on top of that, also giving giving Chopper someone to tend to, giving him something to do, something that that is who Chopper is, that feels right to him, tending to Zoro, and, you know, reminding him of all the miracles they've seen, of all they've been through, and telling him there is no reason to doubt. Now tend to this. Now tend to our crewmate. It gives Chopper comfort as well as a task. And I really, really love that. But then on top of that, then Sanji th goes and fights a dinosaur, <laughs> which I just, I just really like it. Uh, and then our whole crew and everybody adjacent to our crew cheering that Luffy is gonna win and their renewed hope and excitement. <sighs> oh man, Yamato facing off against Kaido. Kaido who, there's so much gaslighting in this series <laughs> from every bad guy, from every villain we face. There's so much gaslighting that happens. Anyway, poor Yamato has been through so much, being chained up and beat down and uh, suppressed in so many ways and, and facing off against Kaido and saying, I already know I can't win, but I'm going to hold you back. Oh. We get to see Yamato's devil fruit form, which is this, I, I don't know, ancient dog, and it looks awesome so good. I'm jumping ahead again, 
But the fights that we get with Yamato and Kaido are so satisfying because again, it's not just a fight. It's all that Yamato has gone through to get here. It's all that Yamato has had to face off against and fight through to get to a point of holding off Kaido. It's all the emotional baggage that comes with their situation. It's all that they've been through together and all that Yamato has been put through. All that is in this fight. We end up learning that the Sabretooth feller that Jinbei is facing off against was once a member of CP9 and in fact was the one guarding Luffy's devil fruit, which means that there's some really big significance behind uh, Luffy's fruit. It wasn't just luck of the draw. He didn't just get a weak one that uh, that he had to figure out how to maneuver into something cool. It was being guarded by a member of CP9. So that's something significant. Also, through that exchange between those two, we find out that the sun god is real. And, oh gosh, we get a lot out of that, actually. There are connections to the panels of Skypiea, that really weird bonfire panel that, I, that didn't make any sense to me. I don't know. You know what? Again, I'm really not skilled at theorizing. You guys probably already know what you think. I don't know what I think. Again, this is my disadvantage. Having read this series once, there's a lot of lore and world building that I haven't fully wrapped my head around. So Luffy is being connected to the sun god because of, because of the panels where Luffy is kind of looking the same as the panels of the sun god, which is, this isn't the first time that he's been connected to gods in the series, but also the will of D. Isn't the will of D to take down gods? Isn't that what we know about the Will of D so far. So Luffy is Joy Boy, and also maybe, maybe he, Luffy has inherited the Will of the Sun God, was the Sun God Joy Boy, and now Luffy has inherited the Will of Joy Boy and is the next Joy Boy. Is Joy Boy just like a title and not a person, or not exclusively a person? Joy Boy was a person, but now the title is being passed down to, I don't know. It's a mess up here in my head but the fight was really cool and I love every Jinbei fight because I love his fighting style and because I love Jinbei and I love his one-liners and I love everything that he does. And him fighting off against a saber-toothed tiger looked awesome. Um, Marco has been holding off these two right-hand men of the Emperor of the Sea for a very long time. He is beaten and he is tired and I don't really love this magic formula thing that we fed Zoro in order for him to just be like good all of a sudden. I don't understand that or understand how that's not gonna kind of break the world because I, I mean, it's it's easy. It, it was cheap and it was easy. I think that's basically all it is. Like we need Zoro to be okay now. We need him to be okay instantly. Do we have an instant solution? No, okay, I'll create one. I'll introduce it into the world just for this very moment and then we'll probably just forget it exists. We probably won't use it again. And I don't like that. I mean, if it becomes a significant part of the world and suddenly now this matters, then maybe I'll care about it. But probably not because it was introduced at the point where we needed it for plot to progress and so sometimes, sometimes Oda introduces things lazily. I think this one was lazy, but Zoro's up and going again. And I love Marco standing up. It looks like King is going to slap down Zoro and Sanji when Zoro's still all wrapped up. And Marco's standing up and blocking them and then saying, well, first of all, he mentions that there's an entire race of people living on, of gods living on top of the Grand Line. Is that what he says? Atop the Red Wall, who burst into flames. Thanks for dropping that little bit of lore. Appreciate it, Oda. What do you mean? <laughs> I'm gonna need a whole lot more on that. But then he, anyway, then he says, it is time for the stars to take the stage. I love the first, the, fir the second in command, Pops is number two, who's here because he wanted to be here for Ace and now he's here for his brother, standing up only to step aside for the next generation, led by Ace's brother, for Sanji and Zoro to step up and work together. Oh, I love it when they work together. I love this dialogue here. Hey, Twirly, once we conquer this battle, yeah, we're gonna catch a glimpse of Luffy as the king of the pirates. 
I guess I just don't have words for this one. The two who are directly under Luffy. The two who are like brothers who are constantly getting on each other's nerves and constantly bickering and fighting. But when it comes down to it, we'll fight side by side and we'll protect each other. Standing up and saying, we're about to catch a glimpse of Luffy as the king of the pirates. That is, that is some incredible stuff. Sanji's body is feeling a little bit off. I don't know what's going on there. We also have some hinting that Sanji's body isn't fully human. I don't know. He's not using his Sobo guy outfit. He's not using his, uh, <laughs> the Transformer outfit. He's not using that very much, even though it's obviously very, very powerful. His body feels weird now that he's been using it. He has the black leg, the fire foot powers, and now he's being challenged that he's not fully human. There's a lot going on with Sanji, and Zoro is stepping in and defending him and block making blocks for him and taking care of him. I love, you know, Sanji's been protecting Zoro all this time, and now Sanji feels a little bit weird, and now Zoro's protecting Sanji. I love these two. I love their relationship. I love these two so much. I love every time that they get to be together because they bicker, but they protect each other. I love it. There's a lot going on with Sanji. I don't know. But guess what? There's a lot going on with Momo, too. I have so many concerns about what's going to come of Momo being aged up to 28. He apparently looks like his dad. I'm excited to see what his new character design is. His new dragon design is incredible. But I really hurt for Momo. He's lost his dad, well, his parents. He's lost his parents. He's lost his land. He's lost his throne. He's lost his future. And now he's also lost his youth. And having his mind still be of a child and being in an adult's body. I'm not saying, I mean, he's obviously not gonna turn into another big mom, but that is, that is what we have with big mom. And that is why she's so unstable. And that's why she's so, such a wild card and, and such a mess is because she's a child's mind trapped in an adult's body because of trauma, I think. It's a different reason for Momo, but we can't pretend that he hasn't experienced a tremendous amount of trauma recently. And I'm not saying that he's turning into another big mom. I definitely 100% don't think that's what's happening, but there are a lot of moral implications to this. And I'm, I hurt for him. I hurt for him that on top of everything else that he's lost recently, that now he's losing his childhood too. He's losing his youth too. He's now about to be an adult. And like, don't look me in the eyes and tell me that this needed to happen in order for him to become the Shogun of Wano because there have been child emperors in the past. There have been child kings. They just have a group of counselors counselors around them that help them make decision, decisions as they age up. This happens. This is a thing that has happened in the world, and I'm sure it's happened in the One Piece world too, and he did not need to become an adult in order to be the, the Shogun of Wano. He didn't. It didn't need to happen. It needed to happen for this moment in order for him to get Luffy to Kaido and in order to have what I assume is about to be an incredible face-off between Momo and Kaido emotionally. It's about to be something huge for Momo. I don't, don't, I don't have a lot of predictions on how that's gonna look, but it's going to be incredible, I'm sure. But I hurt for him. I hurt for him because he now lost his childhood too. He's now in a 28 year old's body and he's now going to be compared to his dad even more because apparently he looks like him. But I don't want his youth stolen from him too. And he's already been through so much he's had to grow up really fast, but I hurt for him in this development. Even though his dragon character design is incredible and I'm sure his adult character design will be really cool too, I hurt for him. I have no idea what's going on with the Yamato flashback. There, the, there's so many questions that I have with these three men that were in the cell and that gave up their food and that I don't, I don't know. You probably have theories. I don't. I'm very confused about that whole section. I really, really hurt for Momo that he is an adult now. And I think what happens between Luffy and Momo here where Luffy's like, what's wrong with you? Just fly. You're an adult now. You're big. Just fly. And I feel like this 
is such a reflection on how the world is gonna start seeing Momo. You're an adult now, just be an adult, just handle it. Just have the emotional maturity to handle the situation. Look at you, you're 28. And this is part of why I grieve for Momo right now, because he's still a child. <laughs> he's still a child's mind trapped in an adult's body and the world is going to look at him as an adult and he's not. And he can't, he can't carry the weight of the world on his shoulders as a child in an adult's body. But people are going to see him, they're gonna see Odin even more than they already have because apparently he looks like him and they're gonna see an adult and they're gonna expect an adult to lead them. And Momo is a child. He's scared, he's still dealing with trauma, he's still having to, in order, he's having to face heights that he's terrified and he's having to face the man that killed his father that he's terrified of. And he is eight, yet the world will look on him as an adult and I just hurt for him. Oh yeah, uh, Kaido casually dropping that Yamato is the child of ogres. Does that mean that Kaido is an ogre? Does that mean that Yamato's mom is also an ogre? I just throw that in there. Do with that what you want. But anyway, we end it on, again, I was very out of order. I probably should be talking about Yamato now, but the face off between Yamato and Kaido was so emotionally satisfying to me. And then we end it on Momo and what his emotionally satisfying face off with, the, the promise of what his emotionally satisfying face off with Kaido is going to be as well. Luffy riding on Momo. I love this panel of Luffy, again, looking so much like a captain, looking so much like a pirate king his entire time in Wano, standing on Momo's back with his arms crossed, with his arms crossed, with his arms crossed, staring down the emperor of the sea. And I'm just so excited for what's to come. That's it, that's that's chapter 1025. I know I breezed past a lot of things. My daughter is desperate for my attention right now, so I kind of sped up there at the end. But there's so much happening in this in these 25 chapters and so much that I couldn't just talk about that I needed to unpack somewhat because there's so many moral and emotional and 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 family things happening and 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 these moments that we're getting with these characters are just really hitting me really 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 hard. I can't believe how much this series has has become to me, how much it has meant to me. I'm very unstable. I got to go but please chat with me more in the comments. Unpack some of the things that I didn't unpack. Mention some of the stuff that I didn't mention. Feel free to explain some of the stuff that I don't understand if you understand it, and I should too at this point. I'm overwhelmed and excited and having just the best time. Uh, so I'll chat with you more about it in the comments. I post videos every Tuesday and Friday. I'll see you again soon. Bye.